Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis's lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, we'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Anthony. It's great to be with you, Chris. Thanks for uh, this wonderful show. I love talking about Teresa of Avila and her life. La Vita. I just am enraptured with her autobiography of Teresa of Avila. And the more we dive into this, I feel like this is going to sound silly, I suppose, but she's becoming very flushed out for me. I mean, I'm beginning to really, really get a sense of who she is in a real personal way. And where we are in her life story is probably uh, one of the most revealing chapters in the book in terms of giving you a sense of something that is very, very dear and tender to her on a human level. And that pertains to her struggle with friendships, but also her relationship with her father. So where do we find her now in chapter seven? She was sick. And during her sickness, she kind of rediscovered the gift of prayer. She discovered devotion to St. Joseph. And all of that was in chapter 6. Chapter 7 kind of begins with a reflection on how she lost all those graces and how she began to be afraid to pray. And it's not something that happened all at once. It's something that happened little by little. And that's how the evil one works. The evil one when you're zealous for prayer and devotion and you're spiritually alive, he knows that he can't all at once just win you over to evil. So what he does is little by little, he chips away at it. And so the first thing was to distract her enough from prayer to make her feel like because she had been distracted from prayer and because she had kind of not been completely truthful about where she was at with God, she began to be ashamed of praying, embarrassed to pray, embarrassed to think that God still wanted to hear from her, and then she became afraid to pray. The evil one loves that. The evil one loves us to be afraid to do something good. And behind all of that fear and insecurity and concern uh, that I'm too sinful to speak to God, Behind all of that is a lack of trust in the goodness of God. And the evil one exploited that. At the same time, she was attached to relationships that weren't really helping her very much for religious life. Boy, can we relate to that in uh, our own lives? I mean, I know that I've had times where I think I'm doing really, really great, but there's that one relationship with a person who just keeps dragging you down, that can be a very difficult one to deal with, can it? Yes, because God has made us for communion. And so we enter into a friendship because we have some unmet needs or whatever. And this person is meeting those needs for us. And so we dally a little bit too long in those conversations. And what the evil one wants to do is take that friendship that might have a lot of great aspects to it and draw us into it until we begin to lose our desire to pray and then we stop praying. In other words, the evil one, what he does is he takes a good thing and he uses it to distract us from the better thing that God wants us to do. And that's his tactic when you're in spiritual consolation when you are uh, spiritually alive. 
he can't do a frontal assault. He's not going to tempt you with mortal sin at the beginning. He's going to tempt you with a good thing that is not God's will. What is Teresa's state of life? Teresa's state of life is that she is a religious sister in a convent that doesn't take a vow of enclosure. And so that means the relations with the outside world, they're not completely cut off. When she does the reform of St. Joseph's convent, they're going to be more committed to the enclosure. This group of sisters she's with at the Incarnation are Carmelite, but they have a different relationship with the world that allows them to have relationships with people from the outside. Well, Teresa begins to, under the influence of the evil one, begins to abuse that. And her superiors let her abuse that because they think she's more spiritually mature than she actually is. And that kind of gives you an insight. In all likelihood, they weren't very spiritually mature either. It was probably a whole culture that it kind of got into relationships of, of you might call it creaturely attachment, relationships that don't really give glory to God, that don't really support our state in life. When you've consecrated yourself to God, either as religious or in marriage, you need relationships that are going to support the consecration you've made. If you're not yet consecrated to God, if you're someone who's discerning a state of life, you need relationships that are going to help you with that discernment. Other relationships that kind of make you nostalgic for a way of life that you know won't please God or are an escape from your state in life, these are to be avoided. Other relationships that are like diversions and fun and they, you like them because they make you laugh, but they don't really help you engage the responsibilities that God has given you to do wherever you're at right now in your relationship with God. Those relationships are very, very dangerous because precisely they can distract you from prayer. And this is what happened with Teresa of Avila. Now, when we talk about distraction from prayer, are we talking about the time that we have dedicated to our prayer life or is it more of the state of prayer in always being open to listening for God's prompting or his engagement in our life at any given time? It's a little bit of both of that. First, it starts out, God has called all of us to pray without ceasing. That is an com apostolic command. St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Well, how do you pray without ceasing? And one of the ways that you pray without ceasing is just what you described in uh, our hearts, if we're always kind of open and trying to see what God is doing and attempting to respond to it, if we're always mindful that by faith, by the obedience of faith, that he is present to us and that he is sovereign and he is Lord over my emotions, he's Lord over my needs, and he's Lord over the situation that I'm in right now. So how do I respond to that? Well, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of dedication, but it is possible to live like that all the time. And the fathers of the church talk about any number of methods. But one of the things that helps us be that way is also having dedicated time for prayer. And Teresa of Avila, later on, she's going to recommend that you spend at least two hours a day in mental prayer. This is prayer and conversation with God. And she means this in addition to liturgical prayer, in addition to vocal prayers that you might say on a daily basis. You have your little prayer routine. In addition to that, she recommends two hours a day that you should spend conversing with the Lord. And one of the reasons for religious life, one of the reasons for an enclosed existence entering the enclosure is that it allows you that kind, if it's lived well and organized right, it allows you that kind of time. When you're um, a lay person out in the world, you don't always have that much time to spend in prayer. And, uh, you know, when the kids were young and uh, we, uh, um, Agnes and I were frantically trying to, you know, keep on top of all the things that were going on, I'm sure we prayed. I think we spent, uh, we, we tried to go make daily mass part of our lives. At the same time, uh, you know, when one of the kids needed help, you had to let go of prayer and go attend to the kids. That was our duties according to our state of life. Um, 
now it's different now that our kids have grown up our we have more time to spend in prayer and and so we we look at uh, what Teresa recommends and we try to make that part of our our daily life and it takes uh, you know commitment day in and day out to make that well in order to make honor that commitment we need friendships in our lives that help us honor that commitment to the Lord we needed friendships in our lives when we were young parents to help us be good parents, but also honor our commitment to the Lord. When a friendship, though, distracts you by because it's entertaining and because it makes us feel good, it distracts us out of either being mindful of what God is doing in this moment, attending to his presence, responding to how he's acting. That's kind of like a this is virtual awareness of God no matter what we're doing. Or it distracts us from the time we ought to spend in prayer that we've dedicated to God, whatever that might be. Then there's something wrong with that friendship. It's a friendship that is not helping you grow and make God first. That can be a real important distinction, even when it's between friends who may have a relationship and what they see at the time, a, a spiritual context. And what I mean by that is sometimes we can get wrapped up in things in the parish or we might get involved in these different groups and we're having these great conversations about God with those people at the time, but we have to be careful that it's not at the expense of time that we need to be with our families, maybe with our parents or in circumstances that may not be as joyful as being in those other settings, but may be what the Lord wants us to go and to be with him in those areas. Boy, you really articulated that well. The cross of our daily responsibilities and obligations, it involves a lot of dying to self. And it's so easy to seek shelter from that death his self and all the daily events that unfold and responsibilities that we have that we need to observe. It's so easy to, to try to find reprieve from that daily grind of living the Christian life in friendships that really aren't, they're not evil and, and you know, in and of themselves about anything sinful at all. They're, they're good friendships, but they're just something that distracts you from what God wants you to do here and now. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers. 
for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. Also in this chapter, too, we see a side of Teresa that is so poignant. When you really read it, Anthony, there have been times when I've read it, and it just kind of breaks my heart, and it's the relationship with her father at this particular point in her life. I don't know. At at certain moments, you just the way she's writing it, it just kind of cracks your heart a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I I think it's one of the most beautiful moments of self-awareness and uh, sincerity in the whole work. What you're referring to, for for those who haven't read chapter 7 yet, I encourage you to read it. What's gone on with her is that on one hand, she's involved with these relationships. On one hand, she's kind of stopped praying uh, because she's afraid to pray, because she's let sin into her life in all kinds of little ways that aren't so little and have robbed her of the joy of the presence of the Lord. She's observing all of her religious practices. She's wonderfully observant. She's doing all the things a good religious is supposed to do, but she's not having this personal conversation with God every day the way she knows she ought. And, uh, and she's afraid to. So what this does is set up a perfect storm. People are coming to her from outside of the convent and even inside the convent, and they're asking her spiritual advice, and she's giving it, and uh, she's read a certain amount of spiritual literature, and so she is able to give all kinds of wonderful advice to people. And they are helped by her advice because she's repeating things that she's read from good spiritual authors. She's not giving bad advice. She's actually giving pretty good advice. It's it's only that she's not living it herself. And so it's in this context, her father also came to her and asked her advice about how to live the spiritual life. And as she was giving him advice, he took it to heart. He really lived out, observed the discipline of daily prayer, observed unceasing prayer, observed good observance of discipline each day as as, uh, ascetical practices. He was dedicated to the Lord and to following, to going to confession, to going to communion as frequent as would be allowed at the time as for a lay person. And so he came to live a very devout life. And so as he was growing in his devotion, she was decreasing in in her devotion And he was still going to her for advice, even though in many ways she was less spiritually mature than he was. And so finally, they have this conversation that gets referred to in this section. And it's a very painful conversation where he's basically asking her, you know, how do you sustain this kind of prayer in the long run? You know, I'm coming up against some resistances in me uh, to... um, to, to maintaining this kind of prayerfulness. How do you do this? And she basically begins, she be, basically tells him, well, um, you know, Dad, to tell you the truth, I, I'm not really praying like you are. Uh, I can't because my health, she makes up excuses. My health is really difficult and religious life is so demanding. They, they ask us to spend so much time in choir reciting the psalms and so forth we don't have time for a lot of personal prayer and and, you know and that with my health and my other responsibilities i just haven't been able to maintain prayer i'm really glad you are i think it's it's great that you're doing it dad but it's just not something that i can do right now i'm fleshing out the conversation but that's basically the conversation that she has with her father and the father hearing this he's heartbroken that he's wasting his daughter's time in conversation, that she's so busy, he stops talking to her, he stops coming to see her, because he doesn't want to be one more distraction in her life from the gift of prayer that he knows she has. Mm -hmm. So he kind of 
steps back from her life. And then in chapter 7, we see that he's dying. Uh, they give him extreme unction. She goes to see her father. And I often meditate on, I use in my own imagination, I think about that moment where, where their eyes likely met. And I think about, I think about, you know, what uh, the, the great hope he has for his daughter when he gazes on her and the beautiful things that he realizes God wants to do in her soul because he's experienced those things. And at the same time, I think about her gazing on her father and, uh, and being ashamed because she presented herself to be something that she wasn't. And, um, and she gave the impression that she was being more observant of interior devotion than she was. And so the, the lack of integrity that she suffered in that moment looking at her father. And at the same time, another aspect of this is kind of the realization that what her father was doing truly worked. I think it convicted her that prayer is really real and that there's good reason to uh, go to prayer, that at the moment of death, this finest moment, the supreme moment of our lives, if you live a life of prayer, you're ready for it. You can accept it. You can accept everything. You, you come into a realization that God is Lord of everything and that you can trust him and that even at the supreme moment, you can trust him. I think she saw the witness of her father and it convicted her in a lot of ways. Boy, I tell you, the, the grace that flows from accompanying someone in a holy death. I'm recalling in one of the possible reflections you could have in the assumption and the, when one prays the rosary could be to pray for the grace of a holy death. Because I don't know about you, Anthony, but I've been blessed to be a the side of a couple of those experiences, and there's nothing quite like it. And I, for me personally, if you don't mind me sharing, I'm, the, it never was a stronger moment than when I sat with my mother at that moment. It convicted me of learning to trust again and to know that God keeps his promises. But when you walk with somebody who has that that experience, it can be it can be life changing, can it? Yes, it can, and and that's um, you know we, we speak about corporal works of mercy and being present to someone who's suffering and dying is is one of those works of mercy that God calls us to, and He calls it to us not only because it's good for the person to whom we're being merciful, but it's also good for us. It's a moment of grace that can rekindle deep down things if we let it. And I think this is what happens for Teresa. I think as she begins to describe her conversion uh, moving forward from here, the seed for her conversion happened in this encounter with her father where uh, there was a kind of moment of truth. And that moment of truth, you know, am I at the place where I really want to be right now? And being in the presence of a soul that is making their final offering to God and summoning all the integrity they possibly can for that moment where they'll come before his face. For those of us who will be left behind and are helping them make this offering, it opens our hearts to deep and very, very good questions. This is part of the grace that Teresa of Avila discloses to us in this chapter seven. Isn't it interesting? Chapter seven, the happy death of her father follows, at the end of chapter six, she was talking about Saint Joseph, who is the patron of a happy death. Mindfulness of death is one of the graces that opens up the whole mystery of mental prayer. And isn't that a real reflection too on what you spoke earlier in our conversation? about the nature of prayer, that it's that time that, yes, again, indeed, that you set aside just to be able to be aware and to receive and to, to relate it all back to the Lord. 
but it's also that 24-7. It becomes that ever-present. It, it's in an every moment, isn't it? Yes, it is. And make it every moment. We also need those times that are completely dedicated to God. We're actually dedicated to Him. And, and ideally, uh, Teresa of Avila speaks, speaks of, of two hours, um, and she's talking to religious, and I realize there's people with all kinds of different states of life out there. But the important thing is that it be uh, a disciplined time every day. So if it's 20 minutes every day, let that 20 minutes every day be every day, day in and day out, dedicated to the Lord, or whatever time it, it would be. I, I was just speaking to a group of priests, and, and one of them said, I need 30 minutes just to let go of my earthly cares and finally enter into the presence of the Lord. I don't see how you can have a good prayer time in, in less than 30 minutes. And I, I tip my hat to him. I, it's, it's actually true. You know, in order to really enter into the Lord's presence, you kind of need to spend a little bit of time letting go of things and entering into the, to his presence uh, before you can actually hear his voice. And so that's one of the reasons why she speaks about this length of time. I, I have another priest friend of mine. He's a student in Rome. and He spends every day and at, uh, at least uh, four hours a day in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. He said, he goes, Anthony, I need time. And this is a very v- busy priest who has global apostolates. It just goes, goes, goes all the time. But he goes, I need this time to be totally dedicated to the Lord because there's a, a certain resting in God the Father's love that Jesus wants me to know that helps me be a better minister of the gospel and if I deprive myself of it, I can still minister the gospel, but not as effectively when I've spent time resting in the Lord. So to go back to your point is we need that time to sustain the moment-to-moment kind of prayer that we need to have throughout our lives, throughout every day, each day, uh, where, uh, where our spiritual eyes are open to the wonderful things that God is doing and um, and, and we're responding, we're helping people see the wonders of his love in each moment because we've spent time, dedicated time, with the Lord each day. Any further reflection on this chapter 7, Anthony? Well, I, I think um, uh, there's so many riches that Teresa speaks about, but uh, uh, just to, to kind of refresh or highlight a small point. One of the great trials when you go to live a prayerful life is to believe in your own sinfulness more than you believe in the greatness of God's love for you. When you allow your sinfulness to eclipse the brilliance, the splendor of God in your heart, you oftentimes will find yourself discouraged from being able to to go to the Lord with trust. And the evil one loves that. He's the accuser of the brethren. So, of course, what is he going to do if you have kind of, uh, once you begin to see your lack of integrity in your heart. What's he going to do? He's going to accuse you. And in that accusation, he's going to say, who are you to spend time with God? Who do you think you are? Don't listen to that voice. Instead, trust in the love of the Father revealed by our crucified Christ. Trust in the movements of the Holy Spirit that are taking place in you and surrender to those. Don't let the evil one, be the one whose voice it is that you obey. Don't let the voice of accusation be the one that you attend to and allow to rule over your heart. Instead, allow the voice of the Father revealed in Jesus, in Jesus who suffered for us unto the death on the cross. Let that voice be the one that you Uh, have 
sovereign over your heart. You allow to be enthroned over your heart. When you do, it's not that prayer is easy. Prayer will be difficult. In fact, the more you pray, the more the, the more you'll have to fa- face your own lack of integrity. And it seems like things are getting worse. But when you go there with the Lord and trust in his love anyway, he can do the most beautiful and powerful things. Things like he did, in fact, for Teresa's father. Well, amen to that. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, Anthony, but didn't Teresa of Avila say that the devil was a jerk or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not those words. Don't well, listen that, to jerk's voice. Yeah, Don't do that. That's, that's probably a good parochial paraphrase of what she said. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. She probably would have said it better. No, but thank you for your beautiful reflection and your your wisdom. We are so grateful for it, Anthony. Well, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for doing this show. I, I think, um, I think Teresa Avila, her wisdom is something that we need, especially today, right now. That it's so easy to get caught up in the anxiety of our times and the the pressing exigencies that seem to be over the media all the time. And I think now more than ever is a time to return to deep prayer with the Lord and allow him to speak to us in the depths of our hearts. Once again, amen. Thank you so much, Anthony. God bless you. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There, too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.